Welcome to Ireland Unfiltered. This week's guest is Deborah Somerin. Deborah is somebody you might not have heard a lot about, but I really feel you're going to hear a lot more from her in the years to come. This was probably the most powerful, most moving and most upsetting interview we've done in the series, but with a woman who has so much to say, is inspiring in so many ways and has an incredible story. Um, we're going to get to that in a minute, but first I've got Patrick Hoy, producer of Ireland Unfiltered, with me to tell us about uh, the competition. Thanks, Dion. Yes, regular listeners and viewers will know that we've been running a great competition over the last few weeks. Uh, thanks to our sponsors, Carlsberg Unfiltered. Carlsberg Unfiltered being a new cloudy pilsner, and very much like this show, this new lager is stripped back. It's less processed with no filter for more natural taste. So we had our first winner, uh, the winner of a pair of tickets to all 10 live at the Ivy Gardens gigs this summer. Mm. That winner is Kevin Fortune. Well done, Congratulations. Kevin. Congratulations. You have a lot of music to see over the next few months, Kevin, so enjoy that. But we have another competition now that that's done. Um, this one is a pair of tickets to every gig at live at the Marquee Cork, which is there's such a, f- a phenomenal lineup, you won't believe it. it. There's people like Tommy Tiernan. Friend of the show. Friend of the show, Tommy Tiernan, one of the standout episodes. Go back and watch it. Um, Christy Moore, David Gray, Versatile, and loads more people. So, similar setup. All you have to do to be in with a chance of winning is watch this episode, come back. We'll have another little chat after, and I'll let everyone know how to enter. Thanks, Patrick. And now here's this week's show. Deborah, welcome to Ireland Unfiltered. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you here. Um, tell me, when did you set up your charity? I set it up last January. Um, the weekend after the late, the weekend of the late late show was when I, I suppose, wrote the idea down. Um, I went off and I started a petition to see who could help me with it. And um, we got over twelve thousand signatures from people that were just. And loads of comments from people just being like, we need this. This would have changed my life. This would help me so much. Um, so that was when we kind of started um, putting everything into motion. And um, we only officially became, it's a very long process to get registered as a charity. So we only officially became a charity um, about a month ago. But okay. prior to that, we were a non-profit. Um, so that was our structure until we got our charity registration. Tell, tell us about the charity. What is it? So we are building student accommodation, well, we're hoping to build student accommodation for single parents in third level education. Mm. So it's going to, it, my vision is that every parent would get an apartment and um, we're aiming for bet- people between 18 to 23. So they would hopefully only have one or two kids and um, everyone would get an apartment, a two bed apartment and downstairs would be the crash. And it's taking away those two barriers that are there for single parents to going to university, which is accommodation and childcare and mm. specifically disadvantaged single parents. Um, Right now with the homeless crisis, HAP is what they have, like these social welfare payments. And even on an income, it's very hard to be able to get, um, to be able to get an apartment. So these people that are on HAP are finding so many other barriers in terms of bias, never mind the fact that it's completely unaffordable for them to be able Mm. to get into an apartment. So if you're a single parent that wants to go to college and or if you're someone who's in college and you get pregnant, what would you do? Like right now, there's you're probably facing homelessness. Who's going to mind your kid? Childcare is like a grand a month. That's not what yeah. you get in social welfare, um, and it's just a really, 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 really scary system. And um, there are some private crashes, of course, and um, public crashes, of course, but um, they have huge waiting lists. And um, the one beside me. I wouldn't leave my kid in it. Um, mm. I was very, very concerned. And that tends to be another issue for people because you're like, how can you leave your kid somewhere like this and go off and be like comfortable in college and studying and everything else? And mm. you're, it's literally all the kids in one classroom. You can do your homework if you want to, like zero to 12, like it's just a free for all. Um, and I wouldn't feel comfortable leaving my baby there. And your so, child, it's called Empower the Family. Yeah, my charity's called Empower the Family. Um, and you set that up, you're, you work for PwC. Yeah. Uh, you came to the studio today after an investors meeting and um, everything would seem to, if you know to, to you know anyone who didn't know you to think this is uh, you know you are an incredibly successful woman who has who has made made it in life um, but when we, you know when you listen to your story when people when you, people hear your story today like where you've come from makes what you've done even more remarkable really um, and you. you were born in London I was born in London. I was born in Westminster. 
Um, I still remember the first time I saw snow. I told my parents that dirt was falling out of the sky, so that was very vivid memory for me. Um, but yeah, so I was born in London. We moved back and forth between England and Nigeria till I was ten. Your parents were both from Nigeria. Yeah, both pa- parents were both Nigerian. Mm. My dad would have trained um, and like gone to college and stuff in England, and then my mm. granny was also like a nurse in England. So there was connections there, but it was yeah. always so. My dad was a pastor, okay. so his he was always like constantly being called home you know, in, in his heart kind of thing. So wherever Caught we lived... Caught home by his heart. Yeah. Right. His flock. Oh, okay. His flock. Right. Um, and um, and that's what's very important to him. Like, um, religion has always been super important and to him. And you were brought up religious. You were religious. Oh, okay. very religious. Really? I wasn't allowed to watch Harry Potter because if there was, like, witches or anything. Like, I wasn't allowed to watch Sabrina Teenage Witch. The joys. So now okay. I don't really get any of the Harry Potter references anyone makes, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> which is annoying. And I keep trying to get into it, but I just think it's different when you're an adult watching them yeah. than when you're a kid and it's so cool. But yeah. So, um, so what do you remember of London? I remember that I don't really remember that much, to be honest. I know that what I've been told is my mum, it was really re- important for my mum that we grew up with English and that we grew up with a good education. And that was because my mum had to walk, like she kept always told us, had to walk two hours to school and two hours back and all of this other stuff Mm. when she was growing up. So for her, us growing up with English and us having a good education was super important to her. Mm. So that was why there was always a fight between my dad and my mum of like, it was whoever won the fight that year in terms of where we were living. so that was that was the back and forth constantly because my dad obviously wanted to be with his flock and my mom wanted us to to have the best. Um, so you so would yeah. spend long period when you say you went back and forth. You mm. might go back for a year and then mm. come back for another year. Yeah, really? literally. Yeah, literally, um, which is insane. But that was that was the I, and that's why I'm like I have little bits of memories. And honestly, I think at this stage I've just blocked out my childhood up until like nine. Yeah. Um, in that I think it was actually just I don't I don't remember that much which is really weird Mm -hmm. um like my brothers and sisters do um and they'll bring things up even like when we see our dad and be like I remember when this happened or that and I'm or like my dad would be like remember this person used to see them all the time and you're ex and I'm like literally I've never seen this person like to me I've never seen this person in my life you know um so I'm I am going through an exercise to try and like maybe unravel some of that stuff and try and dig deeper into it like true therapy and stuff to try and understand like what was what it was like but for for me I felt like we had a it it felt like nine was where it all went wrong I felt like we had a relatively normal life up until then and that was when it all started going wrong that was when my mom started locking herself in her room because she was so depressed and my dad and my mom you know, it got physical between the two of them mm. when they were fighting. Like, that was when I remember everything starting to, r- like, eight, nine, yeah. And when, that's when I really remember everything starting to fall apart. So I don't know why. I don't really, I just don't really have, remember that much before then. And even, like, there's people I was friends with mm-hmm. um, in, um, that will try and r- remind me of stuff of, like, um, there's people I'm, they're close friends now and that were family friends that I would have known and that's how we've, you know, we've mm. reconnected and it's nice for me to have that and they're going, remember I used to bath you or whatever and I'm mm. like, you're like four years older than me and he's like, our families were that close and I'm like, I have zero, like, okay. I didn't even know, you know, so... Um, and is that what you're trying to unlock when you're in yeah, therapy? Yeah, I'm trying Memories. to, yeah, I'm trying to like, I'm trying to piece everything together because like now, um, I suppose... I've been in therapy since I was 14. Mm -hmm. So um, that was a big thing. And that's why I'm probably so kind of adjust, well adjusted or whatever. Um, But say, for example, if I'm in a relationship Mm -hmm. and I have um, a constant worry of being cheated on. Mm -hmm. um, Now I have to dig deeper and I'm like, oh, that's because my dad cheated on my mum, you know, Um, and I grew up seeing that. So those types of things, I just want to have a better understanding of the full picture Mm -hmm. um, of what has happened in my life. So I don't know, I have a better understanding of like if something happens, I can go, oh, that's just this. Ignore it, you know. And does it help you do that? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I'm so aware of that. Um, And it, it definitely speaks to how... I just, how I treat people. Mm-hmm. Um, because I know every, like, e- even if someone's it, it is is bad with you or is rude to you or e- does really horrible things or says really horrible things, 
I know that there's something behind that. I know that there's something that's happened and, you know, mm. that, that's led them to that place. So for me, I have a lot of, say even like the KKK, like I don't, if someone says the KKK or Trump, like I don't hate any of these people because I understand the lives they have led and what has led them to having so much hate in their mm. hearts. And I know that it's not specifically towards me. I know it's specifically because of their circumstances and the circumstances that they feel they're not in control of. Um, so yeah, that's, yeah. I don't know. It's a weird thing, but yeah. And if you, you're able to hold that idea, are you no matter what you hear people say or what people do to you? Because it is, it's a very compassionate way, and I get it. Like the saying, like that, hurt people, hurt people. Like mm. that's the kind of you know, basis of that. But it's a very hard uh, philosophy to hold on to in extreme situations. I'd imagine. Um, I think for me, I'm so unconfrontational. So even if something was to happen. I generally will just not react to it and take myself out of the situation mm. so I can go and reflect on how to move forward. Um, and that's where that reflection of let me try and understand what was going, like, let me try and understand this person and why they would do something like that, mm. why they would say something like that, why they would behave this way. And then I try and make a way to go forward, which is usually around listen, I know this is a tough time or I know this or blah, 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 or, you know, or just readjusting how I'm... S- how I might be communicating with that person or maybe just not communicating with that person <laughs> okay, ever again, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which might be the healthy thing, you know, and that's just the way that I look at it. It might be very, it might seem very self-centered because it's all like in my own head, but I just prefer, I just don't like getting caught up in mm. like over worrying about things and like, I just rather like deal with it and then move on and find a way yeah. to move on. I'd rather that. I hate, I hate, hate, like I don't like carrying hate in my heart for mm. anyone. So, yeah. So you were nine when, when things turned and Mm. changed and how many were in the family family oh god so my dad has like 12 kids as far as i'm aware they keep coming out of the woodwork um (coughs) and so um there was four of us particularly for my mum. so he'd been Mm. married three times okay um and um my um it was there was three of us actually at the time we didn't know that my mum was pregnant um my dad didn't even know that she was pregnant um Although she had, uh, anyways, it was just a very, because that, that's when she started locking herself in her room. Um, I think maybe she was planning to leave him and that just sent her into a very mm. deep depression. The fact that she was felt kind of stuck now. Um, so my mum was watching a lot of Oprah at the time. And uh, I think Oprah gave her the idea to just find the strength to leave him. So she kidnapped the kids <laughs> from okay. school one day and got a plane and left the country. Um, so that's that's the you roller the coaster. Eldest. I'm the oldest, oh, yeah. unfortunately. Um, so I'm supposed to be the grown up all the time. Um, and me and my mum had always had a really tough relationship. Now, Lord only knows, like for me, I try and put into context where that started from. Mm-hmm. Um, and... I know that my dad is a very like he really loves having he really respects men he loves having sons and he had mostly sons there was only one other girl that had been born that I was aware of at the time Mm. at the time you know in terms of in terms of our family so I don't know if it was a disappointment that I because I know that when she was pregnant she was told it was going to be a boy so I don't know if it was like straight away the fact that my dad might have put pressure on her that she didn't have a boy and that I Mm. came out as a girl or the fact that I'm just incredibly stubborn and I'm not as, you know, I'm not stubborn and I'm just, I want to understand if you're telling me to do something, I want to understand why I'm doing it Mm. as opposed to just going, yeah. Um, So we had a very, me and my mum had a very turbulent relationship from from the get-go. But she went through a lot um, when she moved over here and I think she expected that the minute she left my dad, like she could finally breathe, Mm. that it would, like she'd had such a hard life and I think that she, she'd she gone through so much and just kept getting up and kept getting up and kept pushing. And they think finally when she left my dad, she thought, okay, I can finally rest now. I can just, you know, I can stand on my own two feet. And that wasn't what happened. And um, I think her dealing with the fact that everything wasn't turning out the way that she'd expected it to um, was what eventually led to to her suicide and I try and think about that as a mother now you know um I just can't I I I it's something that's so difficult for me um in terms of my mum because 
just thinking about how much pain she was in mm. to have gotten to a place where she wanted to do that because we were the most important things to her. Mm. And um, the fact that she'd like lost all of her kids at the end and I just can't imagine. She was actually homeless at the time, which is something I've, I've never revealed before. And it was actually, she actually passed away in a homeless hostel on Gardner Street. And um, so she was completely alone. Mm. And... Um, she wasn't even found for a few days. So, sorry, can I have okay, some tissue? Okay, yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Right. Sorry. sorry. Right. Yeah, so that was, that was, that's very tough for me. Um, just as a mother, just, just trying to, I suppose, I, I, and I think things like that have just taught me a lot of empathy and compassion for other people. Mm. You just never know what's going on for people. Um, and that you really need to try, instead of making sweeping judgments, that you really need to try and understand what has led them to um, this place um, where they're behaving in a certain way. And, you know, we, we didn't have a good relationship. Um, like the, the final incident that led to me getting the trust of getting a permanent care order was that a, a care worker witnessed my mom grabbing me by the hair and whacking my head against the radiator. Mm. Um, so it wasn't... And you were what age at that time? I would have been b somewhere between 11 to 13. I don't even mm. know. Um, I, don't even, I don't even know. I just know it was all chaos. Um, but um, up until then, I, I was in a care home when that happened. But up until then no one had tried to find like a permanent care order. It was still very back and forth mm. of we're going to try and place you back home and try and make this work. Um, because that's usually what Twisted do because realistically, like it's a, it's a very cramped system. Mm. Um, so when you hear these stories in the media of, you know, this kid died, the parent did this or, and it's always like, and they were aware, they were known to social services. Mm. That's why, because they've taken the kid away and then they've tried to make it work and put the mm. kid back. Um, and then this parent has struggled. So, I mean, I suppose we're lucky that that, that was not our faith. Um, but yeah. Can I ask you, when you came to Ireland, why did your mother, you came to Nace? Mm. Why did she take you to Ireland? Why did she take you to Nace? I couldn't tell you for all of the money in the world. Um, I just know that that's where we ended up. Mm. Um, and but there was no Irish, was there an Irish connection? No, okay. not as no. Right, there yeah. was literally none. No, um, literally none. But I think the big thing for my mom was people. Certain people had shown her so much compassion when she first arrived. Mm. Um, there was one woman. Um, we always used to call her Auntie Anne. Auntie Anne. Um, she was actually a foster foster parent, but we I didn't know this at the time. And actually, her kids who we would have grown up like going to their house or whatever. Mm. They're from Finglas. Um. And I'm st I'm still friends with one of the boys now, but um, you know, the boy was actually adopted, and I didn't even know this the whole time we were, we were growing up. But yeah, like that was a woman that my mom would go and um, be able to cry to and talk about her problems to, you and um, I know that she had there was um, I I don't know honestly I couldn't tell you because it wasn't a big like black population back yeah, then yeah. I don't think it still is now yeah. um, so I don't know what how they ended up there um, maybe it was all that they could afford mm. like whenever they landed in Dub I don't know um, but I don't know yeah and was your, did your father come with you then no 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 it was just your, your mother left him yeah my mother left him um, and the three the three kids and her Three kids and um, three kids and her, and um, one on the way. That was her situation in Ace, um, and um, yeah, no, it was. And what was that like for you to move into to find yourself in Ace as a ten-year-old? Um. Hmm. So I tell this. It's so funny. I didn't actually realize I was black before I moved to Nace. <laughs> <laughs> that will do it. Um, I think that's the big thing because obviously like the UK is so multicultural yeah. and same thing with Nigeria as well. Like, so it's not, it was never a thing and it wasn't something that my parents felt that they would have needed to discuss with me before, like, just so you know, <coughs> yeah. you know. 
Um, so I think the things um, when I was there, just like things like just going around and people just staring at you like you had 10 heads, yeah. you know? And I was like, you had to, and again, this comes back to, I had to go through a period of understanding so I didn't feel like this was racism. This was literally the fact that some people have never seen mm. a black person before yeah. and that's why they're staring at you. So it's really important to go through that journey so you understand that. And, it's, and then obviously some people ask you some very uncomfortable questions and you have to go, what? Um, you know, just, I can't even, I don't even know, like, do they have mobile phones in Africa right. and things like yeah, that? Yeah. And you're just like, are you in, like, what? Um, and you, again, you have to understand that this comes from a place of, this person doesn't know. This person literally thinks that you're like an alien from like mm. this completely different thing. Like to this person, you're not the same as them. Yeah. Um, and you have to understand that you need to um, go through a period of discussion and understanding and just be compassionate to people. So for me, NACE was a great place to have landed in, in a first instance because it really taught me that there was no malice behind mm. things that people would do. Mm. Obviously, like some people there would be. Um, but again, I don't even think that those kids knew what they were saying. You know, they was just like, I know that this is a trigger word that I'll, you know, yeah. I'll, I'll make her sad about if I say it. But it was never, there was never any malice about it. And I think that's the really beautiful thing about Ireland in that um, Brendan Courtney said last night, we're like the soundest country in the world. Mm. Because it, and it, it comes down to the history of Ireland, and especially like me understanding that like Irish people used to be slaves one day, you mm. know. And then I was listening to the Blind Boy podcast, which mm. everyone's obsessed with now, but he did this one with Spike Lee. Now I have no idea if this is true, but he basically his, um, talks about how like hillbillies and stuff are like descendants from from Irish people, but how like Irish people would be like coming back home and be like, or someone going over, it's like, that's wrong what's going over there on over there with like the black people mm. and the slaves and all of this, like the civil rights movement and stuff, um, which is really cool. Yeah, yeah. so I, I see it that way. I see it as like one of those things where if you have a lot of misinformation, if you don't know types of people, you can develop ideas. But like if you know people and you learn about them, I just think we, we have a really beautiful way of looking at things here. And were you able to separate that, the, the malicious stuff from the curious stuff, if you like? And Not when I was younger, no. no. Of course, because I didn't understand. Like, I, I haven't always been this person. Um, <laughs> this is therapy. Um, <laughs> but everyone should have a therapist, by the way. Very clear on that. Um, but no, um, no, I didn't. And for a long time, I felt really unwanted. I felt really... Mm. Um, I felt really like everything was against me. Yeah. Um and I I just I I felt like why? You know, mm. I was just so confused by it, and especially cuz all my friends growing up have always been white because of course I've lived like so I lived in Nace and I lived in Cork and stuff mm. like that. So for me it was always I just didn't understand it because I always saw myself as the exact same. I liked the same things. I went to the same discos, blah mm. blah blah. Um, the the biggest the biggest memory that I have have of this um, in terms of so I went to my first um, no it wasn't my first one one of the discos that they did in Nice the Bondi Beach Disco mm -hmm. and the Bondi Beach Disco was the really cool disco because it was in an actual nightclub as opposed to the Ga Disco which was in the Ga Club <laughs> cool. and um, I was so excited bought my Ra Ra skirt and you know got all mm. my you know was super super excited to go and when I got there I was with my friends and they kept running away from me. And I was like, why are you guys running? And they were, and one of the girls was just like, Debbie, we don't want to be seen with you because you're black. And mm. I left in floods of tears. And um, I remember the people from my care home having to come pick me up. Um, I don't even know if I told them why I was upset. Um, and even if I did like that was not a scenario where people were equipped to this was 10 whatever years mm. ago more than 10 years ago this was not a situation where people were equipped to even know how to discuss this with me and help me tr understand what had happened and mm. not make me feel like there was something wrong with me yeah um so I think that's probably what I carried for a really long time this feeling that there was something wrong with me yeah um and I didn't understand that. And yeah, so I think that's the, yeah. So I think now I think my whole thing 
why I'm just so passionate about all forms of inclusion, not mm. like just women, not just race. Like I'm literally like, I want a kid who doesn't play rugby to fit in, in a scenario where like everybody else plays rugby, mm. you know? Like that's what I'm all about because I, I think I just, I understand that feeling of feeling like there's something wrong with you yeah. as opposed to there's something wrong with the other people because they're not including you, mm. you know? Um, so yeah, sorry. That's the rant, sorry. That's <laughs> <laughs> not a rant at all. But it's, it's hard because being, you know, we've had lots of people on this show who were felt like an outsider for whatever reason. Mm. And it is, it's a defining aspect of many people's personalities because you're, you, you have that dual existence of wanting to fit in but you said to me before that we started talking of fitting in is overrated mm. and there's a there's an energy and a, and a life force in in that sense of being slightly removed as well and what you get from it. and you've clearly taken so much from those experiences yeah um but at that age obviously it's 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 not like that you're not saying this is this is going to stand to me mm. in 10 years time mm. but when you when you were when you went into when you when this um, um, when you left living with your mother then at thirteen was it mm -hmm. where did you go then so initially I left when I was eleven okay um that was the first time I went into care that was in Nace um I missed curfew yeah um and um my mum wouldn't let me in it's freezing um she threw a bucket of water out the top floor window and um, I didn't know what to do so I went to my friend's house and. It's actually the same friend that said she didn't want to be seen with me. For okay. sure, that's a story for another day. <laughs> Anyways, and um, went to her house. Her family um, didn't know what to do, so they called the guards. And we're like, listen, we've like <coughs> random girl here on our couch. Her mom won't let her in. Like, what do we mm. do? So that's the, your first instance. That's how you go into care. You don't go into care by ringing a social worker. You go into care through the guards. Okay. Um, so they were the ones who um, were then like ringing around all the emergency, like... Um, like uh, like the emergency social worker mm. who would then ring like the emergency foster placement. So that's where I went. That was the first thing. I can't remember where I w went the first time. I lived in so many different foster homes between 11 to 13. I, I, I don't know if it was, I don't think, I think possibly Tala right. or Clondalkin or something. I know it was in Dublin. Um, and, and how I, long do you, did you live there? You <laughs> I think I lasted there like two weeks and she got sick of me <laughs> and I <laughs> okay. moved somewhere else. As I say, I'm not the type of kid that you'd be like, do this. And, you you know, mm. I although I was so respectful and so thankful that I was somewhere safe, um, I am, I want to understand mm. things, you know. Um, so she was like, no, she has to go. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't, I, maybe Carlo after that. Um, I lived in Westmead. I lived in Trumcondra. I lived in Cork, of course, which was so lovely. Um, and these were all in foster homes? No, some of them were in foster homes. Some of them were in residential care okay. homes. Um, in terms of 13 was then the, 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 when I moved into homeless accommodation for the first time, which I, I didn't know that once you reach a certain age in care, you can't get placed in emergency foster cares, cares, mm. care homes anymore. Um, because you're too old, you're deemed too old, um, and they generally want to take like younger kids. And did you have in the in the foster care? Because again, Barry Kogan was a, a guest on the show, and he was in thirteen or fourteen foster homes from the age of five to fourteen, I think it was. Uh, and you know, he said this thing about you know you would you would establish some kind of a life, mm. and then it would be you'd be moved on, and that was the like. Did you? have did you feel that because you said in touching it there you said you felt safe like did you feel safe in these places and then get moved on or was there always a sense with you that this was going to come to an end pretty soon i think for me whenever i watch barry talk about being mm. in care i don't know if it's a sense of like jealousy or something <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um and i don't know maybe it was because i was black and i was being placed in these you know random households mm. that like in the middle of no, you know, um, but I always felt I'm, this isn't long term, right. I'm going to be moved, I'm not wanted here, you know, yeah. um, and I never felt settled in foster care, if anything, I felt more settled in residential care, because at least we all just felt wanted there, you know, right. and it wasn't a scenario where there was like two people in charge of looking after me, it mm. was a number of different people just coming in and out, of, out the door, mm. it was very kind of institutionalized, I don't know, I felt, I felt better in that system okay. to be honest yeah. um, 
And I think maybe that's just what, I don't know. I don't know. And there might be, I don't know. Um, I don't know why, but yeah, I, I felt better in residential care. And I don't know, I think they were just, you know, like I don't, when I lived in foster care, I just felt like I was walking on eggshells in someone else's house or something, mm. you know? Um, there was only one family that I really loved and I hate dogs and they have a dog. <laughs> okay. And they had a Labrador. Well, I don't hate dogs. I love dogs now, but at the time I was terrified of mm. them, which African people are going to kill me for saying this and generalizing, but a lot of black people don't like dogs, okay? They're scary because yeah. we don't grow up with them. Yeah, right. So um, even like my hairdresser, when she comes into my estate, there's this really annoying dog that's like a little like Jack, terrier mm. jack russell thing and um just barks and she like i have to walk her out of my estate okay, because yeah. and i this is so generalizing and mm. i'm sure people are going to kill me for it but um please comment if you uh, if you agree <laughs> um but um, and it's not everyone but there is definitely a, a, a big population anyway so um they had a labrador and i remember i loved this house because i fell in love with that fucking dog fell okay. in love with it and me leaving it was because they they got a baby, um, a baby foster placement. So mm. I got replaced with the baby. Um, but it was the longest I stayed anywhere, I think. And I was so sad to leave that dog. I was absolutely sobbing leaving that dog. Like, mm. which is so weird. Um, so yeah, th that's my nicest memory in foster care. And that was, they were a much older couple. Um, they really went out of their way to make me feel like proper Irish mammied, I would say, mm. in that house. Proper yeah. Irish mammied. Um, which is the first time I'd had that. So yeah, there was only one of those homes I'd ever lived in. But no, I never never felt like, oh, I feel like I'm part of this family, mm. you know? Um and they didn't have any kids, so maybe that was why actually. Maybe it was because I couldn't feel a difference. Right. You yeah, know? Yeah. Um in terms of how they treated their real kids and then this random mm. person. So yeah. I dunno. But things like that have definitely shaped me because like, so say the care home I ended up in when I was 14, mm. after I lived in, sorry, so to put you on a journey, um, at 13, um, something happened um, I got taken into care in the middle of the night and I ended up in a homeless hostel in Lefoy House because I was now too old for foster care, mm. um, for emergency foster care. So um, I went through homeless accommodation for a while. Um, nine months altogether um, there's these things called nighttime only hostels which I lived in for a while as well um, How long did you live in them for? At least a month mm -hmm. at least a month um, Lefroy House would be a nighttime only hostel and then the house I moved into after Sherard House that would also had a nighttime only hostel place and I couldn't they, like they were too full to actually put me into like a normal permanent place mm. um, so I ended up going through that service for like at least a month um, And you were there on your own? <laughs> Oh, no, there were other people that yeah, lived yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, but you were living there, you were in for that, yeah, so you were... You, yeah, I you was... You were in a night time, so you'd have to leave at nine in the morning. <laughs> yes, exactly, you had to as leave. As a 13, 14-year-old. Exactly, which is so... 13-year-old, which is so scary, especially when you haven't lived in Dublin, like, yeah. up until then, like, really. Um, so I always say, like, I like my biggest thing was, like, nice. <laughs> like, <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. So I was like, what do you mean I have to go out by myself? You know, I was absolutely terrified, and I'm so thankful. Um, so Focus Ireland um, and, and Tusla usually arrange for someone to check in with you during the day and give you some healthy eating McDonald's vouchers mm. to make sure you're alive. Um, and um, this woman in Focus Ireland that was responsible for doing that was just like, no, I'm not letting her go. Like, she's staying in the office where we can keep an eye on her. Like, okay. she's going to be eaten alive out there. She's only 13. Um, and I'm very, like, naive. I'm a mm. very, I've been a very, like, I don't know. It was just, I, I was definitely going to get eaten alive. Um, and that was amazing. So during the day, I would go and hang out in Focus Ireland's office and, um, you know, do homework or whatever, just different yeah. things that I could do during the day. And um, I just felt so lucky to have somewhere warm to go, mm -hmm. you know, which is the big thing I remember. Um, so that compassion over the years has been huge. So at 14 then, I moved into a private residential care home um, run by, which is really funny because I read in the news that the kids who end up in private residential are the ones that nobody really wants. And I'm like, thanks, guys. <laughs> right. Thanks. Um, so... Um, maybe it's changed. <laughs> um, so I ended up in this home in Drumcondra, and wow. Um, so it's run by these amazing people. Um, Kira and Patty Marjoram. Mm. Um, her mom Mary Marjoram owns care homes and nursing homes. And uh, the the funny thing about Kira and Mary is they come from a very 
well-off background, mm. which means that the work that they do is not about making a profit, which we're very, I was very lucky about because I lived in other private residential care homes where, <laughs> let's just say, the focus was on making a profit. Um, so... How was the folk? How would the focus be on making a profit? Like, what so would you when you so when you live in private residential, they get paid a big chunk of money per week for mm-hmm. every child that they have, and you get to determine how you run the home, how you staff it, and everything else. So, say for example, when I was in Dunanog, it was whatever we needed to make sure we turned out to be functional human beings in society. So, mm-hmm. for example, I got grinds, um, and right. when I was doing my exams, in other care homes, like you that was not a thing it was Mm. not trying to give you a normal home it was not trying to give you as close to what your friends have you know in terms of like a a normal upbringing in terms of what you need for education there was one home I lived in um when I lived in Cork actually I didn't go to school at all um because they hadn't they hadn't sought a school for me before they moved me there and I spent the whole year and none of the schools would take me and it was every meeting I had with a social worker I was so angry I was like I still don't have a school I still don't have a school Mm. um and then the homeschool was like dragging their feet before they even got that sorted. So it was it was just like for me. And it's it's something that you'll see if you speak to other kids in care as well. It's something mm. that's been revealed more and more now that those like they're being run as like franchises nearly, mm. you know, like it's someone that will just open like 10 or 12 residential care homes. Like this is the first time I've ever met a proprietor of a care home. I've yeah. never met someone who's owned a care home before. Mm. And I've lived in at least Three. Okay. Um, in terms of the res- the residential ones. Sorry, no, five including the homeless ones if you want to include them. But mm. in terms of the private ones, I've lived in three and I'd never met a proprietor. And as opposed to this, Kira was always coming in to help us. Um, it was always whatever we needed. We felt supported. And that's that's very, very unique mm. to um, the experience I had anywhere else. Um, and to put that into context, when I got pregnant, I was only there a few months. And I was terrified I was going to have to move. So um, what age were you when you got pregnant? 14, mm. you know. And I, my, friends are, my friends are like, Debbie, I wasn't even looking at boys then, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, um, that was when I got pregnant. It was with a boyfriend. There was nothing like, you know, no one groomed me or anything. Mm. Um, and um, I got pregnant. I was terrified. At the time, the rules meant you weren't allowed to live in a mainstream home if you had a baby in care. Yeah. So I was going to have to move out into a, there was like, at, at this stage, I think there was only one or two private mother and baby homes in the country. Um, one there of the, were still mother and baby homes in the country. Oh, they're called mother and baby yeah. homes. That's what Tusla calls them in yeah. the care system. So um, I was going to have to move to a state run mother and baby care, care home, which I was terrified about because I'd heard horrible stories. Now, so I think like the Magdalene, you know, mm. any of that mm. stuff, but it was very much so there's like HSE people hovering and if you screw up once, your baby's taken off you. It's not this, like you're not going to get support. No one's going to help you, teach you how to be a mom, Mm. you know? So I was terrified because I was already like out of my depth as a parent, Mm. you know, getting pregnant at 14 and then having to go to this place where I was going to have to be perfect was scary. Um, So Alan was the manager of the care home. Alan is a second dad to me now. Um, When I met him, I was all like arms folded and all stroppy and everything Mm. else and completely rebelled against this. But, um, he went and um, t- talked to Kira and Paddy, and uh, Paddy's her husband, mm. and said, can we convert the home into a mother and baby home so that she can stay? Yeah. And that we can support her because I was in school. You know, like there was a path there that mm. for them, they just felt like there was, there was, it was worth it. I don't know why. I didn't feel like I was worth it, but they felt it was worth it to stick with this kid and make sure at least one <laughs> turns out yeah. okay. Um, and... Um, they converted the home into a mother and baby home. They lost a lot of money doing that. Um, there was a lot of lawyers and everything else involved to do that. And But it was very much so Kira got all of the solicitors in the world involved and was just, mm. she's not moving out of this house. You know, she's, we're going to support her. Whatever we need to do, we will do it. Mm. Um, and just constantly jumped through whatever hoops were put in front of them. Um, and what they asked for was for me to get an opportunity to learn how to look after my child properly and um, while also staying in education. And... Um, when I was pregnant. Um, so this certain things have come out of Kira's own pocket, I know. Um, so things like I went to cooking classes and stuff so I could learn how to cook yeah. for my child. Yeah. Um, even the grinds I went to in the Institute, um, mm. those things would have really hurt them in terms of profit because they didn't need to send me to the Institute for grinds when I was pregnant. Like I was in third year, you know. Yeah. Um, but she really wanted to give me the best chance of passing those exams. Mm. Um, and I still... I, I, 
it's um anyways it was it was surreal and things like that made me feel this is a home and hmm. um, these people care about me and um, for the first time ever and um, I felt like I was cared about and um like I could actually you know I was determined to stay in education I was determined to get my exams and get to college because no one was going to do that for me and where did that come from so I definitely think um, I, I can't underestimate the fact that my mom mm. had always prioritized education. Yeah. That was probably ingrained in me subconsciously somewhere. Um, although if she told me to do it, I would have said no. Okay, right. <laughs> I had to come up with the idea by myself. Yeah. Um, but um, I think just I knew that I have this baby. I'm every, I, he doesn't have anybody else. He's going to have a really substandard life a really crappy life sorry mm. for the French but if I don't do something to change that and the only way I'm going to change the fact that we're probably going to end up on social welfare for the rest of our lives or me working in some like minimum wage job is true education that's the only way for me to increase how I'm able to mm. to provide for my kid and um, so the minute he was born I was mama bear I was completely all about like protecting him making sure he was cared for and um yeah, that's, I, I, I just think that was a big thing. The other thing as well, though, is I'm such a brat. So um, the uh, when I was in fifth year, um, my maths teacher pulled me out of my classroom. So I, I went to a new school um, after I had Liam. Um, and um, my math teacher pulled me out of my classroom. It was a really disadvantaged school, really loved it there. But the, the gro- I say the, the, the young people were the were grand. I loved the young people. They yeah. couldn't care if I had one or 10 kids. But the grown ups were the issue because obviously they have their own stuff that they have from mm. years and years that they're bringing into it. And this was a very disadvantaged school where not a lot of people went to university, if any. So for them, this teacher pulled me out of the class and said, oh, I think you should do f- think about doing fourth year because you're probably not going to do your leaving cert because you have a kid. And I remember going home and telling Alan and Kira that story. They still go mad about it to this day. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were like, how dare her do that? How dare her say that? Blah, 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 blah. Um, and um, I was so determined to prove that woman wrong. I would stay in like studying and everything else. Right. Like just really, really, really dedicated to proving her wrong that I was going to be able to do this. Um, and I was very lucky that Duna Noak supported me to do that and supported me in whatever way I needed. And um, so they gave me like seven hours babysitting per week. And okay. that, that meant, um, so say for example, if Liam had got his needles and he was up all night crying and I I could drop him in. Um, Liam, Alan does this great impression of me r- arriving at his door at 6 a.m. Baby. <laughs> so I could get a couple hours before school. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, that those things were huge. Mm. I would have, like, there's no, I would have been so, it would have made it 10 times harder if I didn't have things like that. Or if I was, okay, I want to stay in and study an extra hour for something. Can you pick them up um, from crash for me? Yeah. No problem. And um, that was really the things I was able to use with those seven hours. So I'm so thankful to them for that. And they taught me how to be and a parent that could stand on her own two feet. I moved Mm. out when I was 18 because that's the rules of living in care. Mm. So I've been on my own raising, like I was raising a two-year-old while I was in university, but I knew how to do that. It wasn't hard because they'd supported me and like gradually taught me how to do that. Mm. Um, And was the system, like when you look at it now, do you think the system helped you at all or was it the people who were in the system bypass the system yes the second one a hundred percent and literally so um i'm in the process of becoming irish officially um Mm. and um i literally had to put all my life together in documents and everything else to submit and um it was page after page after page of people going Debbie's given this an exceptional basis or we found this loophole and then people writing a letter being like because of this you can actually do this if you wanted to and then that person feeling you know that organization Mm. feeling pressured because there is room for that in the legislation you know for Mm. aftercare services and everything else and then eventually agreeing to it after initially you know saying no even like things like my grant and to go to college they initially said no (laughs) and then I just remember um Nicola which is one of the care home staff was in the office all day and she, she you don't want to mess with her by the time she came out she was like you have your grant sorted <laughs> um so you know those were the types yeah. of people I had in my life and for me like for me doing this like doing empower the family I like that was a no-brainer I had mm. to do it They're, those are the people who raised me people who had constantly gone to bash and people who had constantly like they didn't need to do any of that to mm. make sure that I had the support that I need needed so I could learn how to look after myself mm. and my child um, and that I could do that successfully um 
that's everything to me and I need to give that back to other people because I know it's not like it's not someone else couldn't do what I'd done mm-hmm. um, unless they went off and like I had so many different organisations involved and it was literally this thing where so one of them is Epic which is Air Advocates for Young People in Care and I would literally like look up all these people on the internet and then I ring them up like literally like 14, 15 year old me like blah, blah, and I'm having this issue and will you help me um, and I'd write letters and all this stuff and that's stuff that other 14 and 15 year olds don't know to do mm. or aren't doing um, so I want to help these people be able to make something of their lives and um yeah and change that and i mean so do you think the system because we had leah varadkar on this show and he's talking about homelessness and i was saying about children growing up in emergency accommodation and he said well look the average time span any child spends in emergency accommodation now is six months so people are well we know that's a lie well yeah he said there are exceptions we might you know uh, but even if you take him at his word like your experience of that, six months uh, as an average time to be spending in an accommod- uh, emergency accommodation for, for a child is still a long time. Um, yesterday I met with someone who works in the government mm-hmm. who told me a story about um, meeting a, someone who had been going through the system for two years. Mm-hmm. The mother was going, um, was in college every day. Going to, going to college, all she had was her car. They were living in homeless accommodation for two years mm-hmm. while she went to college. And she was actually studying, I actually think she was studying accounting or business or something. And that was all she had to make sure the kids got to school every day and she'd go off and study. So for me, when I hear things like that, it just breaks my heart because I know, and he knows, that's not the reality. Mm-hmm. He knows. And I like, like these kids have nobody else. Mm-hmm. They have nothing else. And if you're the kid sitting at home in emergency accommodation, who's been in there for longer than six months, who's been in there for a year or two years, Mm. and you're watching him say, oh, it's an exceptional basis, and you know there's so much more than you. Like, it just breaks, that's what, that really, really breaks my heart because what those kids go through, even after I did the Late Late and I talked about um, my time only hostels for, for the first time, I got emails from kids that were like, 12 13 who had spent christmas in them were like thank you so much for highlighting this like people didn't know that these Mm. things existed um and when i speak to these kids they just feel like nobody cares like and that's the big thing for me with empower the family focusing on disadvantaged single parents this is a community that i've come from that feel left behind that feel Mm. education is not for them that feel they're not wanted there that feel ignored and when you have a politician that's the leader of your country that's supposed to represent everyone in your country saying things like that. It, I just, I, it's so damaging. It's never mind the damage that it does to the kids already being in emergency accommodation. I just think it's damaging for them mm-hmm. in terms of their self worth of like, I actually don't matter. Like, this is actually. Anyway, so um, in terms of what There's it's. No, like, anyway, you can sorry. say, no, no, that's that's important. Um, it's important that you say that. Um, and I generally stay away from politics. So I don't know how you got me to do that. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's. It, it, anyway, so in terms of what it feels like as a kid to be going through that system, it is hugely damaging. And there was a report just brought out by a researcher um, in DCU called um, Grania McKenna, who had spent. Um, um, I think it's Grania McKenna. It's Grania. It's Grania, anyways. And you can look it up. But it's a research that she'd brought out, and she spent time in those homeless, ho- mm. those emergency um, homeless hubs, and everything mm. else. The Focus Ireland ones, the government run ones, and like it's horrific. The poor woman is like literally broken from being just even mm. going in and seeing them. And even for me, like I know that there's at least four families that sleep in ICHH, um, inner city homeless, mm. uh, helping homeless. Their offices. There's a big Georgian building, um, just beside Connolly. There's at least four families that sleep there every night because they can't get accommodation. Mm-hmm. That's a bu- That's just an office building. It's not a home. There's like it's not like there's beds and apartments or whatever. That's just this is so. Uh, anyways, I, I dropped some stuff in there um, just before Christmas, and um, it was in the morning, and I saw the families coming out or waiting there that had slept there the night before. It just broke my heart. It's just normal people, just mm-hmm. a normal woman with her baby, just broken you know and I remember that from my own parents and I remember that from my own mom and from my own upbringing I remember that feeling that my mom had of just I I should just give up Mm. and um especially now when you hear about the fact like there's really scary statistics like the suicide rate for single moms in South Dublin for the first time now matches the suicide rate for men Mm. in South Dublin 
for single moms. Mm. That is how bad of a crisis we actually have. And the lack of compassion around things like that, it just, I just don't understand it because I just wasn't raised that way. Even like, it, it, I just wasn't raised to, to treat people that way. I, I, people have had so much compassion for me growing up and it doesn't even matter how I was raised. It's just not right how you treat people. Mm. These are your people. Um, and I feel they're my people and they're literally, literally like on paper, they're mm. not. And I just, I don't understand how you can be that detached from it to not care about what those children are going <coughs> through right now, to be honest. You say you don't normally get into politics. I'm listening to you here and I'm thinking, why don't you go into politics? <laughs> no. So, no, I think you, like, would you ever consider it? No. <laughs> why not? Um, I think that the big thing for me is the fact that there's only realistically two political parties mm. in Ireland. Um, I'm a huge fan of Mary O'Rourke, of course, mm. because of Fergal. Um, and um, I watched her videos and um, how outspoken she was before it was cool to be the woman mm. that's outspoken and just said what she needed to say. I love that. So um, if I was to ever pick one, it would be Fianna Fáil. But then, you know, there's there's times that you worry because for me, I'm like... I wouldn't say I would say I'm center left. Mm. I'm not I don't want to I, I understand capitalism. I am an accountant. <laughs> mm. Um but say like Michal Martin getting into that agreement with Leo to continue mm. the government. For me, I saw that as uh, that as a huge opportunity to finally make a difference in terms of the homeless crisis. Um if we had either had an election or he could have played hardball to get Owen Murphy out or something. Mm. Um and for me, that was when I went, oh, maybe I'm not, you know, I, I just have to think about yeah. things because that wouldn't, it doesn't sit with me to be part of something that isn't in line with my mm. values. And my values is like, you're literally, you become a politician to look after people, yeah. not to deal with literally polit politics and mm. all of that like nonsense. So for me, I'm just like, leave me out of it. I don't need that in my life. Um, and I just try and just not get involved, not not like side with any party or anything. I just I just find there isn't any one party, even like with the Social Democrats, then with everything that happened with Ellie and mm. the fact that just hung her out to dry. Like I would have previously been like, mm, I mean, if someone put a gun to my head and I had to vote for someone, mm. it would probably be in the Social Democrats. And now I'm like, not for all of the money in the world. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, it's just it, for me, it's it's because of there's no political party that I feel fits with my values mm. and who I am um, at the moment but yeah but I think Fianna, Fianna Fáil is probably like they are doing a good job and they have done well they're not doing a good job but like they have done in the past to so say things like the um, free education mm. that's Fianna Fáil mm. um, so things like that go to the core of, of who I am um, for fighting for people like that so yeah sorry such but, a tangent but yeah no, so when did you decide uh, that you wanted to be an accountant? Oh my God, since I was like, literally like since I was born. Really? Um, and I don't know where it <coughs> came from because I, I think it was just this thing of, I really like numbers. It was mm. like my safe haven. And it's really funny because the same thing with my son. It's the only thing we, like we don't really need to think about. Um, okay. We just, we like I would sit there doing accounts budget all day if you let me. Like I absolutely <laughs> would love it. And same thing with my son, he loves maths. Yeah. The, not, the book we read at bedtime is called The Number Devil, which is this like 300 page book learning literally all about maths and algebra and everything else. And he loves it. I tried to read him Head Bombs, which is like, you know, the mental health book, which I love. And he's mm. like, I don't want to read this book, read The Number Devil. <laughs> so, you know, that's that was something that was always a thing for me. And, and I always loved doing budgets. Like I remember even sitting down and doing them for my mom and being like, okay, don't worry, mm. you know, let's draw all your money and blah, blah, blah. So, and then I remember people watching me and going she's definitely going to do something with numbers one day so mm. I don't know why I don't I don't even know how I even knew what an accountant was but it's literally people that meet me now go oh my god remember when you were younger and you said you wanted to be an accountant I can't believe you're an accountant now I'm like yeah how did I even know what an accountant <laughs> was like um, and I, I think some people genuinely think I'm lying and um, say like when I put it on my job application they're like no she did not want to be an accountant when she was younger but mm. I just I just always wanted to do it and I think now with my philanthropic work mm. That's why it's hard for me to say, oh, I'm just going to do this. I'm just going to, because I've worked so hard for this qualification and it's yeah. what I love. So being able to do both is, is really my sweet spot. What age is Liam now? He is 10. 10 going on 50. Um, he's amazing. He's an incredible kid. He's nearly as tall as me. So mm. he's definitely going to be towering over me in the next year. Um, he... 
he I, I like to describe there is no other way to describe him apart from a social justice warrior <laughs> and that's nothing to do with me I swear to God um, but you know um, he's just amazing he has so much compassion for people mm. and he's the type of he's the type of kid like if someone some kid's picking on a little girl you know like you know won't give her back her jacket or whatever and she's getting upset Liam will go over step in because Liam's a big kid he's like a mm. really big stocky kid so Liam will go over step in and be like you know, get the jacket back and be like, blah, blah, blah. And then this other kid will then turn around, you know, want to hit Liam and Liam will come crying to me. Like, mm. you, and I'm like, what did you think was going to happen? Like, <laughs> don't get involved if you're not going to think of the consequences. <laughs> Although it's great that he gets involved, but like, that is Liam. He puts, he, he, he puts doing the right thing and caring about people first. And yeah, he's amazing. I'm so proud of him. And how has, it's, how has your experience shaped you as a mother? Like, what do you bring to it because of what you've been through? Oh, my God. Um, So I think in terms of that's something I learned about myself in terms of work, because you have to learn what your skills are through literally working, not Mm. what you put on your CV when you're first applying, because you don't know. Um, But that's my biggest thing in terms of my teens is the effect I have on people. Because I mammy everyone. And mm. I will mammy everyone from the partner <laughs> to the person who's the intern fresh in the door. Um, like, that's what it's brought to me, I think. It's just this caring element that I have for people. Mm. Um, and this, like, I always, I'm, I'm always looking out for people. I'm always... I, if anyone's talking about someone, I'm always the person that's like defending this person. I might never have met them in my mm. life. I might not know them, but it's just constantly looking out for people. And that's something I naturally want to do because I'm a mom. And that's, yeah, that's something that's, that's, yeah, that makes it amazing. Yeah. And were you in contact with your mother when Liam was born? Um, yeah. So um, my mom passed away when Liam was um, like one and a half. And um, was he? No, he would have been, no, sorry, like nine months um, and around then. And so that's the big thing for me in that. So her first suicide attempt um, was um, the year after um, he was born. So he was born in December, so it would have been the year after she would have passed away in like the September um and that's when everything really started going downhill and um I can't even remember when I when the first one was but I just remember being very much so I'm not I can't deal with this I need to focus on my kid Mm. I need to focus on on my family I don't know what's good on 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 Liam like this is my new this this little person and so I was very much caught up in school I didn't know what was going on um and as much as possible the people around me tried to shelter me from what was going on. So say, for example, my care home might get a a call about another suicide attempt and they might not tell me or they might only tell me if, you know, she's in the hospital or there was one time she tried to walk into Port Marnock Beach. So I I went to visit her in hospital. I don't even know how I I think maybe even my brother might have told me and it wasn't them, you know. Um, So anyway, so she did meet Liam. Um, I... uh, she was at this stage in her life where, so initially when I told her I was pregnant, she wouldn't speak to me for months. Mm. And I don't know why something switched, but then she just became very happy for me. Um, and she saw Liam as this light. And um, so she did get to meet him. Um, I told the funny story about how she named him Joshua and refused to call him Liam for the first few months. And... <laughs> um, speaks to how stubborn we both were (laughs) um and um there was one scary incident and this is like the last thing i remember before i I don't even know how it was one of the last things i remember anyways because she she was going through homeless accommodation at the time um because after she committed su- tried to commit suicide, the kids got taken off her, which meant that like she was less entitled to so many other things. So mm. she ended up in going through homeless accommodation. So she would come to me, to my care home during the day, um, as somewhere to, to be able to to stay and have some and um I remember one scary incident where she just held Liam 
was just hugging him, wouldn't let go. And I was just so scared. And um, I just really, I, I just really wanted to have my baby back. But for my mom, it wasn't even like, I, my mom was just getting, she just really needed him, you mm. know. Um, she really needed that hug, you know. And I was just really, really, really concerned. And I think the big thing when I when I was shocked was my mom was always so proud of her hair. Um, Nigerian women and their hair, it's not easy to grow Nigerian hair. So um, one day she went for a nap in my room and um, I went up to wake her up. At a time she told me to wake her up and I saw that she'd shaved off all of her hair. And um, that's probably the scariest thing for me which is so weird but that was when I knew that something was really really going wrong and then I was more involved in trying to get her the help that she needed but I was so young I was only 15 when this was all going on and um you know she was going through the mental health services but they were all convinced that she was faking there was nothing wrong with her and um she had like a mental health social worker and like for me I just I think I just had faith that all of those services would sort it out you know um Anyway, sorry, I'm going to be gross now. Anyways, um, <laughs> not facing the camera anymore. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that was the big thing for me was just... Um, it was it was good that she got to meet him. And especially like after I had him and after she passed away, I understood that was probably where a lot of that learning of what was going through, for, what my mom was going through came from because mm. I was a mom now. So mm. I understood how hard it is. Yeah. Um, and I just, um, I, I wished so much like whenever he was going through different things. Cause like when you're a mom, like you call your mom mm. for advice because you don't know what you're doing. Yeah, <laughs> like when they're teething and they're crying nonstop and yeah. you're like, why won't it stop yeah. crying? And um, you call your mom and they're like, give them a carrot or whatever to chew, <laughs> to chew, <laughs> chew on for their gums. And I didn't have that. So I just, I think the big thing for me is I just carry a lot of regret that I wish she'd held on a little bit longer and um, I feel we would have had a much better relationship. Um, but I also know that she just really needed peace and, and she was just so tired. And um, yeah. Um, sorry. That's okay. Um, I never cry. I never cry in these things. How did you do this to me? Okay. We move on to something. Yeah, we will. Funny. We will. We will. <laughs> <laughs> Lighter. Um, yeah, no, it is. And I can't believe, I don't know why I was comfortable enough to go into all of this today because those are two massive things I never, ever talk about. Um, or I'm really like, yeah. But I think it was good to do mm. it. Um, and um, yeah, sorry, go on. And what are you going to do next? Because you've got your char charity. You've got, you know, you're a high-powered accountant. Um, but is there anything else you, you, what else do you want to do? Like you, you were doing an event in RTE last night. So my dream job would be head of DNI, head of diversity and inclusion for a major corporation. That's mm. my dream job. So I'm, um, and that that might be that I carved that role out um, within the organisation that I'm in now mm. or something um, down the line, but I need to work towards that and I need to earn my stripes. Mm. And so I transferred to a new department, a um, new consulting department called People and Organisation, where they do all of that type of work and diversity and inclusion consulting mm. work so I can get trained and learn about it. And I suppose for me, like long term down the line, ideally we'd have Empower the Family in every county in Ireland with a mm. university and I'd be head of DNI <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> like that's like the end goal. Yeah. Um and and that's yeah, that's that's pretty much and I, I because for me, like, you know, I can't keep working I can't keep worrying about I, I wanna live in the now. Mm. I'm so blessed and so happy with how my life yeah. is now. Like me and Liam are so settled. Mm. Um and I love that and I don't want to do anything major to uproot that. Um yeah, I'm starting something fun with RTE. Um, in a few months but um, that's it, that's in line with who I am mm. and, and the things that, that I'm passionate about um, so yeah no I'm not um, not going to take over the world or anything <laughs> <laughs> and are you in contact with your dad? 
Yes, I am. And is that, re- have you been in contact with him all so, through? So it's this really weird relationship me and my dad have in that, so we're the bottom tranche. We have a WhatsApp group that's literally called the football team. There's so many of us. Mm. Um, and we formed that WhatsApp group last summer because my dad had heart failure and he had to, um, We everyone had to nip in, a bit, put in a bit of money mm. to, to, to pay for it. Um, but my older brother, my oldest brother, um, who lives in England, I'm the closest to him now since my mum passed away, like more of the kids, the older kids that mm. we would never have known um, obviously like stepped in to, mm. to try and help where they can. Um, and they have a very different relationship than what I would have with my dad mm. in that my, that it's nearly like my dad got to the end with us and was kind of, okay, I'm going to be like, I'm going to learn from all the things I did wrong previously and how I messed up previously mm. and how I let these kids down. Um, unfortunately, that didn't necessarily transfer translate to his wives. Um, although I think he was better at my mum than he probably has been with previous wives. Mm. Um, and I think he expected that my mum would just, you know, put up with it until he was until he was ready. And so it's a weird relationship in that I love my dad. Mm. He can do no wrong. He can literally, no matter what he does, no matter how much wrong he does, no matter how much wrong I witness him do, no matter how much wrong I hear that he does or he has done, He's my dad. I only have one dad. I only have one parent left now. And so me and my dad and have a very, very close relationship. I'm the favorite child. Mm. Um, and, you know, I, I think that's literally because I see my dad that way. I see my dad as, OK, I'm going to call him out when he does things that aren't OK. Yeah. Um, and we'll have big, huge blow ups um, and I'll have a big, huge like, it's your fault this happened, blah, 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 blah. And then we just won't speak for a couple of weeks and then we'll just go back to being normal. Mm. Um, because he's, you know, my dad's 76 now. Yeah. So he's an old man. Like there's there's nothing that's going to come out of it for me hating him or any of these things. And um, I just have a lot of compassion and I understand that he's had a very hard life. Um, I can't imagine working in England like 50 years ago or whatever mm. um, was a very easy thing to do. Like 40 years ago, sorry. Um, it was a very easy thing. He's had his experiences too. He, um and I think that um, his priority has always been providing for his children and not necessarily emotionally or physically, mm. but financially. And mm. um, he's tried to work really, really hard. And whenever he hasn't been able to do that, I think it's just really affected him. Um, and he's he's acted out in, in ways that other people just dismiss as the behavior as opposed to understanding what's behind it which is mm. a man trying to provide for his family and trying to look after his family and feeling like he can't um so i have a lot of compassion for him um and i love my dad and um yeah we're we're we're, we're very close um he was at my graduation and um Are you proud he's so proud he's so proud so proud so upset because the thing for him is he's just like and every time I accomplish anything, he's just like, I wish she hung on a little bit more to mm. see this, that everything was going to be okay. Um, so yeah. Um, but no, I, I love my dad. He doesn't live here. He lives in Nigeria. Um, which is tough. Um, that we, especially like after my mum died, then you just feel completely alone, mm. you know? But mm. yeah. And do you think Ireland has changed? Yes, massively. Oh my God, thank God. Um, I think <laughs> I think, um, I think one of the big things is now, oh my God, I love this. So if there's anything like racist or whatever on, on like um, Twitter or anything, like for every one racist comment, there's like 20 Irish people being like, shut up, you're an idiot. You know, like mm. it's just like so many people just being like, what are you talking about? Yeah. You know, um, and I love that because I don't know if ev- like other countries are lucky enough to have that. Like in America, I certainly don't think that like for every one bad comment, there's like 20 people going, you know, shut up, you know. And mm. um, that's how a lot of anger or whatever grows. There's a lot of people just willing to go to bat for the fact that this is wrong. Mm. Um, and I love that. I'm, I'm, I'm like with the Ellie thing, that was something that was just amazing to see so many people going, what is this? Why did you do this? You had so many other things, lists of politicians you could have gotten to mm. before you went after this poor woman. And um, people calling stuff like that out it's just it's amazing it's actually amazing I count myself so so lucky to be a black woman that lives in Ireland so lucky um, and yeah I think I think we're on the right track I definitely think that there's work to be done um, mm. in certain areas but I think that overall we're, we're doing a pretty amazing job 
Deborah, that was fantastic. Thank you. It was so moving. Thank you. I didn't make you cry, though, so. (laughs) That was Deborah Sommerin, who I said, as I said at the beginning, I think we'll hear a lot more from. An incredible woman uh, with a phenomenal story. And we're all kind of moved here listening to her. It was powerful. And I found it kind of really difficult listening to her times, Patrick. I would imagine you did, Dion, because myself and the team were in the the control room next door and genuinely, like, it was the most moving uh, interview we've had all series. And then there was moments where we, like, laughed uncontrollably as well. There's some fantastic things. Uh, Deborah's just a force of nature. That's all you can say about her. It's just, she's a fantastic story. She tells it and owns it so well. And I think, like you say, um, incredibly ambitious, incredibly talented and incredible drive. And like you say, we're going to see an awful lot more of her in the future. So it really is fantastic stuff. Um, maybe you can tell us now about the competition and how to enter. Sure. So uh, as we mentioned at the start, we have a great new competition now. Um, thanks to Carlsberg Unfiltered, our show sponsor. So these, this is a pair of tickets to all of the gigs at Live at the Marquee Cork coming up this summer. Uh, amazing lineup. And all you have to do to be in with a chance of winning that pair of tickets to all of the gigs is log on to joe.ie forward slash Ireland Unfiltered. All of the details are there. We're just going to get you to answer a very simple question and you're in the draw. Great. Thanks, Patrick. And don't forget to subscribe to Ireland Unfiltered on all the usual channels. See you next time.